<laughs> I love that you just like have that ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, my highlighter looks crazy in this lighting. I'm in my guest room right now. <laughs> I just have it, you know. I love it. I like to do the thing where you go to Spirit Halloween the day after Halloween and just buy everything on sale. Yeah. So I bought costume like I have I have some different goddess costumes. That's actually really uncomfortable though. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I just did a deep dive into Empire early Empire Rome. Just like a really quick one to reaccumulate myself because I I said this on my Instagram story. I know you saw it, but um just for anybody listening that I had this one professor while I was in college who was so fun to listen to that I would get stoned every time before his class. I would just like go to the parking lot, smoke, go to his class and just enjoy him. Like <laughs> he really like when when Rick describes Mr. Brenner, or I guess Percy describes Mr. Brenner in that first chapter of The Lightning Thief. A lot of classics professors are like that because they want you to be interested in the subject long term. So they will have replicas of Greek and Roman armor. They'll have like replicas swords. They'll talk about the mythology very animatedly. And it it really, that's why I went into classics is because seeing those people, it was like, okay, I want to be one of those when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> it does look really fun. Like yeah. it does from the outside. I've always found this stuff interesting because it just, I don't know. I feel like when we're in our like dorkiest self, we're like having too much fun that we don't care what other people think. <laughs> yeah, I will say that like the the subject is still very white male dominated. Um, I had two female professors while I was, or no, three. I had three, but all of which were white women too. So it's, there's not a lot of diversity there. And um, diversity isn't really talked about. I can think of one play where diversity is a subject, and that is um, Euripides' Medea, where she was from Colchis, which I think is supposed to be in like East Asia. Um, and so she gets dumped by the hero Jason after they've already had a couple kids for a Greek princess. And like, that's the one time I've seen in mythology them deal with myth, like with racism in a way. But yeah, like it's, it's a very white dominated subject. I will say that. And that's probably why, like why it was easy to fizzle out interest after a while. <laughs> yeah. But I do love that Percy Jackson is putting some diversity back into it. Yeah. It's definitely needed. And there's so much there that you can go into that it was always stupid that nobody ever did. Yeah. yeah. So, um, like the context that I want to give behind the Medusa myth, because someone had said this in my comments of the video I did on Medusa, is we have to consider that Ovid did frame like his his whole telling of mythology in a certain way. So the beginning of Ovid's Metamorphoses is he's going to talk about how things change like about different metamorphoses over time which is why it's these collections of stories of people getting changed into like animals or or things like that and um the other portion of that is he was in exile at the time by the the emperor who was most like let's make rome great again um so augustus's whole thing was almost calling back to the way that other monarchs channel their authority where he wanted to go back to the roots of okay we say that rome was founded by aeneas who was the son of venus coming from troy to here and then after a while there were twins romulus and remus who were sons of Ares and or mars in the roman and that was the founding of our lineage. And so Augustus wanted the, to call back to these like kind of more religious roots. The city itself, super superstitious, like the most superstitious. And the gods are just built 
everywhere into the city. So it's very much like they they wanted the gods, their versions of the gods, more so than the Greeks, to be moral. They wanted them to be, you know, the type of people you'd be proud to have built a city upon and um, like to have all over your city. So Ovid writing these things, Ovid writing about how the gods rape, about how the gods don't really give a fuck about mortals and all of that just kind of flies in the face of this whole like religious reformation that was going on. And like the reason for his exile was a little bit of that as well. Um, it was supposed, I think like the exact reason isn't known, but people say it was, he wrote this book called the Ars Armatoria, the art of love. And it was a bunch of stories where they, he took mythology again and was talking about picking up chicks. Like, um, and you know, like some of it's good, some of it's not good. Um, some of it, you know, is very much like joking. I am going to shed light on this stupid culture. And yeah, so when we take the Medusa myth out of that, Athena is probably, I would say, like other than the big three, Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, she's like Zeus's right hand man. Like she very much is the favorite daughter because he gave birth to her himself. He like feels so proud of that. She feels so proud of that. And she sucks up to him a lot. And I think Rick definitely like he caught on to that. And then you have this myth where this goddess who is, you know, so great, who is Zeus's best child, just totally flubs a situation. I mean, it's not like gods can punish each other. So like the whole myth with Medusa for anyone listening, if you don't know it is Ovid's version is Medusa was a mortal woman and she was very beautiful. Poseidon took her to a temple of Athena and assaulted her there. And Athena as a punishment to Medusa turned her into a Gorgon. Um, that's not the, the version that exists everywhere. I mean, Percy does acknowledge that, uh, or Perseus, per, like the actual hero Perseus in another account, does say that she was changed because of something that happened with Athena. But for the most part, it's Ovid's invention that Medusa was taken into a temple and then changed as a punishment. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he takes one of the most special gods and is like, look at this horrible thing she did. And also the Arachne myth. He doesn't give her a good light in that one either because it, the, from the way he wrote it, it's almost like Arachne was winning the competition when Athena like yeah. took her out. So um, yeah, I think that that's worth mentioning in, you know, the discussion of Medusa because if, you know, if Athena just doesn't look good in general in Ovid's telling of it, like that is a thing, it's worth mentioning. Athena might not have like been a part of this horrible thing that happened to Medusa. And um, I mean, Poseidon, it's interesting that Rick includes this, not so much in the books, but in the show, because in the show, I feel like they are, we've talked about this already. They are trying to make Poseidon kind of look more wholesome or more like he is above the Olympian bullshit. It's, yeah. it's a weird mix because the show is like, it's, it's trying, but it's also so early on. Like the show is, it's a, like, it's honestly a more accurate depiction of when you have like a parent that is not in your life at all and you're mad at them. Like you're mad at them when they're not around, but if they come and talk to you for five minutes, you're gonna like drop all of that shit because you love your parent and they and you want them to be there. And so I feel like, because even in like, I, I know I've said this before, but even in that, the scene that they have in the finale, like Poseidon still is very like, not great with Percy like he asked him do you think about my mother and he is like go yeah. and you can and you 
like what you can watch like walker scobell's face go from like being like amazed that he's talking to his dad to feeling betrayed like you're supposed he's supposed to feel betrayed in that moment and he should be because his dad isn't talking to him he's stonewalling him for the millionth time already and he's only 12. and so like they do but i think honestly a lot of that comes from the flashback scene they had with sally Mm -hmm. and when you watch that scene you just like want to think better about him and sally even though that doesn't really make sense for how he is and it's like you're going against your better judgment and the the stuff about medusa i think is a good a way of like talking about that because it's it's one of those things of like sally never talked bad about poseidon Mm-hmm. But just because she didn't doesn't mean that other people didn't have horrible experiences with him. And it's like in Percy's head now that he did something like that to her in some way. Even if 12 year old Percy doesn't understand exactly the context, it doesn't really matter. Like he, you know, Medusa was hurt by his dad because of nothing that she necessarily did wrong. And, yeah. it, and it, I just love that because that's a hundred percent like how many fucking documentaries about abuse need to come out this year where there's like people that are like i never had that experience with that person and it's like that's nice <laughs> like that's yeah. just literally nothing <laughs> like when i kind of think i i can't remember if it was in the books or not but when i think of how sally and poseidon must have met like what interaction happened there i imagine her being just like a cute young girl on the beach having fun and poseidon notices her like i I don't imagine it being any more than that i i mean like i feel like the show gives us hints that maybe they had more of a longer relationship i'm thinking like you know summer nights in greece you know like the idea that they hung out at the beach all summer together or something like that like yeah I, it's it's hard because yeah you don't get the impression that sally was assaulted but she was still left to raise a child on her own in new york in the modern day and um with like a lot of problems with monsters constantly attacking them even though he didn't know yet because he was just that powerful like that is a lot that she went through on her own that he probably witnessed or knew about in olympus (laughs) yeah like he one of the moments from when they talk in like episode seven that i thought was really great was how when she asked like do you want to talk to him and you hear like thunder going off like basically zeus being like no yeah And, and i thought that that was great because it just shows that he like poseidon knows that he's fucked up like he knows that like sally was 19. yeah (laughs) they had percy and so it's like he knows that he's not supposed to be doing this he knows what that kid is going to go through his entire life he knows that he's abandoning them and there's nothing that he can do about it and that he's his kid is so powerful that everyone is constantly going to be go after him just for purely like the like uh, even his own brothers are going to be going after him trying to kill him just because he's there and that's his fault mm-hmm. and it's like you can't like act like that's not a dynamic of what's going on there like Poseidon had to have actually made the choice to like do things with Sally she didn't know and so it's one of those like <laughs> consent is so interesting to think about because it's like could it like she consented but did she really because she had yeah. no idea what she was getting into she thought he was just a nice guy and then to find out oh actually I'm the gr- I'm a god and yeah. this child is going to have people coming after them for literally their entire life and they and they probably will die by the time they're 20. <laughs> gosh yeah and when, with these gods i mean i know it's a kids series so they don't really get into this but like you kind of get the impression from greek mythology that whoever they mess with ends up getting pregnant you know like that they are very very fertile so like he knew if we do this, even if I'm pretending to be a regular, like 19 year old dude surfing with you in the summer on a beach, you are going to get pregnant. Like you will have a child. And yeah, Sally didn't consent to that, but he did. And that's, 
the yeah, the power play there is it's rough to think about yeah and it's like it's easy for him to say or like to make that decision because he doesn't have to deal with like the actual consequences of anything that he's done like percy's been gone through horrible things before he even realized what he was and then ever since he's just constantly being reminded that he's not supposed to exist like people it's like I like that Rick Riordan does that because that's the whole like abuse dynamic over and over again. Like we're told all the time that we shouldn't exist when you're in an abusive family and that you don't belong. But like they're very like aggressive about it when you go through the books, like the very last book that just um, came out last year, not even a year ago, last October, the very beginning of the book, Poseidon is telling him he has to do like these quests to get into college. like as if he hasn't done enough already and yeah. his dad says like you owe a debt and he's like what do you mean and he's like you owe a debt for existing yeah so because you exist you have to do you have to do all this extra work constantly even though it's not anything you did like in the third book they had an they have an entire like scene where the gods are like legitimately arguing about whether they should kill him like just in front of his face just being like he's too powerful like zeus and athena are like should we kill him <laughs> and it's like oh okay <laughs> he's 14 and they're just sitting there arguing about whether they should murder him because he's because just because he's there yeah and so it's like could it <sighs> And it's just like you just watch that and you're just like he didn't do anything wrong he's just trying to live his life and people are like doing this stuff to him and it's not his fault that he was ever born mm -hmm. and it's hard to like know that poseidon and the other gods for that matter like all of the big gods but that they, they put their kids through that that and just because they want to like do something <laughs> i don't even know why just because they're gods but yeah. it's just like the hard thing that the world is set up in a way where they never have to deal with the consequences their kids do and they just have to deal with it yeah and i i mean the abused kid aspect of it really does like his when you're reading these myths they don't talk about you know like what these people grew up like they don't talk about how they're feeling when they get sent on this mission or something. And like, there is a lot more purpose to quests as they would call them in the Percy Jackson universe in like Greek mythology, like there's a canon reason, but having these quests that you have to do just because you exist, I don't know, I guess I, I feel like that's more Hercules than anybody of just, you know, he keeps getting misfortune because of Hera and yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely an abused kid like allegory in a way like not even an allegory it's just like straight in your face for a lot of it like rick riordan isn't exactly like trying to use like i don't know like illusions or anything he's just straight up saying these kids are abused and it's messed up that they have to go through this at a certain point it's pretty aggressive when it comes to it and like the the thing i really liked about the tv show's depiction of Medusa the most is how she describes her like curse mm -hmm. as like not a curse yeah. as like nobody will ever do this to me again because nobody can even look at me um that just describe like that just makes me remember like with abuse especially sexual abuse like trying to get like your power back any way you can that's one of those things that we kind of do is do things like that of like oh like this horrible thing happened to me and maybe Athena was trying to punish me because she's a the most like enabling pick me person in the entire world but like it doesn't matter because this actually works to my advantage because now I don't have to be afraid of being hurt like that again because nobody can even look at me so that like I would be happy if that happened to me at a certain point in my life I would be so happy that nobody could look me in the eye I would be I would leave the house more much more often if nobody could look at me. <laughs> and yeah. so I loved the fact that they brought that up and especially with like 
the way that Annabeth reacts to her. When I first watched that, I was like, Annabeth is being like a victim blaming person right now. This is wild <laughs> to like- It's her mom who did it, yes. you know? And it's like amazing to watch that because that's not Annabeth, but it's like, she's she feels like she has to do that because of her mom, because her mom is the one that did it. And it, there's like a million things to say about Athena, like doing what she does to like protect, to like try to like, I don't know, um, get favor with her horrible, abusive dad. <laughs> like that, <laughs> that's definitely what's going on there. Yeah. But it's just like, that's not what you're supposed to do though, ma'am. <laughs> you're, you're not supposed to want to make the abusive man happy by like being horrible to your children and other children to make him happy. Like the reason why Athena doesn't like, it's, insane to me that Athena doesn't like Percy, but mm -hmm. the reason why she doesn't like him is because Zeus doesn't like him. Yeah. And it's, that's literally all it is, is. She just comes up with reasons not to like him, but there really is no actual logical reason, especially when you get to like the, like the third book, when he spends that entire book trying to save Annabeth's life and he saves her life and does all of this for her when everyone else is like, why are you going after her? She's probably dead. And just for her mom to be like, I don't like that you're friends with my daughter. I think that you're like dangerous. And he's just sitting there like, what? <laughs> like, I, I've been having dreams about your daughter being tortured. And I just like went out of my way to help her. And you're and you think that I'm not a good friend and that she should stay away from me. <laughs> like, it's just so wrong <laughs> to like yeah. say something like that to him. And it's especially wrong when you really think about it and realize that she's doing it purely to try to make her dad happy. And like, it doesn't even make her dad happy because her dad will never be happy. <laughs> How many times have our neglectful parents not liked somebody that does more for us than them? Dude, I cannot remember legitimately one person, one singular person in my life that my dad actually liked. Like <laughs> not even like a friend just like an acquaintance, a neighbor of mine that was like being nice to me and letting me like sit at their house for a while instead of being at home all the time. There's nobody, there's nobody. Like there is, there was nobody and there was nothing that we could ever do. Like he didn't like doing even, not even just me, like even like my sister, like my mom was telling me the other day that when, when my sister and I were little, mm -hmm. Um, that we did like swimming lessons, which makes sense because we have a bazillion lakes around here. And so it's actually a smart idea to do it as soon as possible because we lived on all of those lakes. And I was so I was asking her, like, did we do that? Because my sister is my niece is doing that right now. And she's like, yeah, um, your sister was much more into like swimming, like competitively, like a swimming team because mm -hmm. she's a much more like competitive, like cutthroat sort of person. And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like she is and she's like but she wasn't allowed to which and she's like oh i don't need to explain to you why she wasn't <laughs> you guys you guys could, couldn't do anything yeah and, like, <laughs> and i just started laughing because my mom and i can talk about that sort of stuff now but legitimately there's nothing that anyone can do to ever actually make them happy because they don't they just don't want to they just don't they want to control you and so they're always going to find something wrong with everything you're doing and I think that's a, why it's so hard watching the stuff with Athena through the years with Annabeth and with Percy, especially with Annabeth in the beginning before they get to like St. Louis. It's so hard watching her try to be such a good daughter. No, yeah. mom does not give a fuck about her and will never be like satisfied with any like Annabeth is literally like a dream demigod kid. Yeah. Like, she's been at camp since she was seven. She's completely dedicated to the world to the point that she like her and Percy don't get along purely because he points out how abusive the world is that like that's the pretty much the only reason they don't really get along besides just being traumatized and not knowing each other and like not trusting mm -hmm. each other. But that's like the main thing that they disagree about. And mm -hmm. like the scene in this episode when they're starting to argue and Percy is like, well, why don't you just ask your mom for help? And uh, she has to like admit them that her mom doesn't fucking talk to her and he's, yeah. 
And like, he's just assuming that she does because of how Annabeth is so dedicated to her mom. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I just like, the first time I watched that episode, I just started laughing because I was like, that's every abused kid with their parent. Like you are you try to like please them so hard and they don't even acknowledge that you're a person. <laughs> it's like, even when they're not there, like she, I mean, Athena is, theoretically there she could probably hear it she probably knows if annabeth says something against her but yeah like i love that percy comes in and immediately challenges all of the rules he's like i'm going to talk bad about the gods i'm going to question their parenting i'm going to question their methods mm -hmm. um especially with athena being the primary kind of you know uh i guess demigod parent he's up against is um because I would imagine Athena to be way too logical, like um, logic over emotion completely. If you think of her as the embodiment of battle strategy, you're not thinking with your heart on the battlefield or you're going to die. Um, so having connections, having bonds with people isn't fruitful um, in a way. It can be, but it also can be a detriment. And that's knowing that she can just make more kids i mean and that she's gonna live forever there's gonna be a million more kids after annabeth yeah she's a drop in the bucket that's like a lot of why she says that she doesn't like percy like that's the reason she gives anyway um <laughs> in the third book i think where she says that he is that his fatal flaw is that he would destroy the world for somebody he loves which like yes absolutely he would but I don't think that that's a bad thing. And it, that world thinks it's a bad thing because they treat people like they don't matter. Yeah. But in general, that's not a bad thing. But it's, I think it's like amazing to hear Athena say stuff like that to Percy as if it's a bad thing when the person he is trying to save is his daughter, her daughter. Like yeah. Annabeth. Annabeth is who he would do that for. Like he would do that for other people, but Annabeth and Grover. And Annabeth is the one in in the books that is kidnapped and is in a bad place in that book, literally being tortured and he's having nightmares about it. So are you mad? Are you mad right now that your daughter's best friend would put her life and her safety over like the good of the quest? Because does that really matter right now? <laughs> like, does it really matter? Uh, like like does it truly does it actually matter like if you look at something like that like if you look at somebody who is dedicated to keeping your daughter safe when you know that she's very intelligent and smart and literally a, a strategist like during like the war stuff like mm -hmm. she's the one coming up with like their plans about how they're going to beat chronos and so it's like you would think that you would be glad that she has somebody in her life that prioritizes her, even if he's sometimes seen as like a loose cannon. Yeah. But the fact that he's Poseidon's son and that he doesn't use like the priorities of the rest of the abusive like family system mm -hmm. makes that too dangerous for her. Like she can't even just put it aside for for even like a moment. And it's just like, what does any of this even matter? <laughs> Well, I mean, a loose cannon, it, I think that's also a factor here. Like, she doesn't like that he goes in and wins fights with no strategy. I bet that. I bet that there's part of her that's like, he is personally snubbing me because if I am the embodiment of battle strategy and he doesn't use me, like, hello. I think it's, like, amazing that all of this happens before we get to St. Louis. Right? <laughs> that's like, oh, my God. That that is a subject in and of itself just like oh my god that is just such like the abused kid story that we're that happens to all of us 50 million times throughout our lives with anyone really anyone in our family not even the parents like even that happened a lot with like my sister like we try so hard to be like good and in our minds like what we think would be good or just assuming like this person wouldn't let me just die, right? And then it's like, no, they actually, they would because they're mad at your friend. They're not even mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's like watching Annabeth in this episode is so interesting, especially I like how Percy is the one that decides to like go inside because of how his mom talked nicely about Medusa. Mm -hmm. um, and is like, I don't think that she's a bad person. And 
in the books it was more like straight up like she's a monster and she's trying to kill us in this it was much more like no she's a survivor like she says and a victim of things a, a victim of this world too that just happens to have like powers that could make her a monster now and she obviously tries to kill them so it's not like she's like you know perfect or anything but it just forces them it forces annabeth to think about her mom in a way that she's that she really doesn't want to like percy is trying to get her to do that but she's like resisting as much as possible but you can't just like ignore medusa <laughs> Yeah, and I, Medusa was the perfect person to pick to get both of them to question their parents. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's a little bit of both of them. There's not another story where I can think this one's going to get both of them to question their parents. Because you tell the Athens story, which is the origin of their, their feud, where they were vying for the city of Athens. Obviously, Athena won it because she gave them a olive tree, whereas Poseidon gave them water. Um, you know, they, they both can make an argument. I mean, both of the gods made an argument on their side. But Medusa's the one where it's like Poseidon was wrong because, at least in the version that's in this universe, she was assaulted by him. And Athena is wrong because she punished her for being assaulted. Yeah, that's never the right thing to do. I'm remembering how in the books, there's much more of a discussion about, um, like Annabeth doesn't like Percy at first because he's Poseidon's kid. And it's a whole, they talk about that like rivalry throughout the first book. Like when they get to the end, like when he's going to go meet with Zeus, she's like, and he's like, if the war happens again, like what side would we be on? And she's like, I would be on your side, idiot, we're friends. <laughs> But like that's like a whole storyline that I'm glad that they don't have in the in the show because it just doesn't really matter. There's other things, but yeah. it is interesting when it comes to this stuff with Medusa and everything because I don't know. It just it's just uncomfortable. <laughs> Neither one of them like to think about this, and they already don't like each other, and now they're like being confronted with how their parents did like opposite things basically to somebody and was involved in hurting this person that they wouldn't be okay with like you can't you can't really justify it like what really no matter what happened to medusa she was like like if you go with like the myth that they're going with that she was a normal person and then was like made into this other thing because of being involved with the gods like it's never right to like do that to somebody because you're upset with them yeah it's just yeah it's just it makes them think about it's very i think it's easy for people like annabeth who have been at camp their whole life who have never had to be on the outside to just tell herself that like her mom always does the right thing and the gods are just always right and just or like even if they're not they're like the only thing that we have so this is just what i'm gonna do it's a whole other thing to actually meet people that are like telling you no, this person ruined my life. Yeah. And I keep having, I keep coming back and getting killed. And then I just come back again later. And there's no like way to get out of this. And I wish that I could just get out of it, but I can't. It's like so much harder to actually deal with that. And they're actually having to. Yeah. Yeah. And God, I just lost my train of thought. But with, um, with the whole Medusa myth, I, I love that Rick also pulled in that feminist part, that feminist, like, you know, she didn't deserve it because, I mean, there's no way to logic yourself out of, like, you can logic, okay, Athena's temple was desecrated. Um, that's not a good enough reason because who's the actual perpetrator of the desecration? It would be Poseidon, you know, like, the thing I was going to say before was I really like how they talked about it with like like that quote that I sent you that Rick said where he was saying that it's, a, it's an abuse of power. Like no matter what happened, I was like, oh, my God, I love that you brought that up because it is true. Like these are literal gods. And so like Athena is mad and wanting to take out her anger on Medusa, who does not have the same amount of power as she does, even if she was like a Gorgon, is still not at the same level. Yeah. And so it's like, you're mad that somebody that you ignored 
was that who said that they were dedicated to you did one thing one time and you're so angry that you're now taking all of your power out on them when they when you know that they can't do it it's like they can't do anything back to you to hurt you in the same way that you're hurting them yeah so it's like it's not right that you did this and that's the part of like the god stories that i love that percy jackson brings up all the time that it's like you know that what you're you have to know that you're misusing the power that you have because there's no way that anyone can actually do anything to you we're like we're all just kind of sitting here like at the whims of you and if we say one thing badly you like toss us aside like per, like in the next episode percy sends them like or at the end of this episode percy is impertinent and he sends them medusa's head like I don't know what else to do with this thing and you guys are annoying he sends them her head and that is enough for them to be like they deserve to die and it's like how how is anyone supposed to ever deal with you if you do one thing that they don't like and it doesn't hurt anybody it doesn't like nobody even knows about it except for you and your like response to that is you should die now yeah <laughs> Well, and I, it goes back to, like, my whole thought that the, the gods of Olympus are more like the Volturi, because it's very much a, we're immortal, we're going to live forever, you guys are puny mortals, there's so many of you, like, there's going to be more of you, so your life is inconsequential, and I think the Iliad illustrates that kind of the best of this attitude that they have towards mortals, where you see them joining people on the battlefield. You see them taking over certain people's images and then like rounding up troops to go harass somebody. Or you see like there was, I was actually rereading a part because I was going to make a video on it where um, Hector comes in from battle and he's told to tell the women by like one of the Trojan seers, tell the women, go lay one of your best robes on Athena's knees and tell her you're going to sacrifice 11 cows to her if she can bring back the husbands, the fathers home safely. And um, Athena literally just ignores them. She just like, yeah. And so they think these mortals are so inconsequential. They're literally playing with them on the battlefield like a game of chess mm -hmm. man i was just thinking i was just thinking of something and i like lost it for a second <laughs> but what i was thinking about is how the way that this world works where people where the gods like don't treat people with respect they treat them like play things all the time or just mm -hmm. they don't treat them like people or just people who exist outside of what they want to use them for um i think it's interesting to watch how the demigod kids like respond to being in that world by like <laughs> percy and it, i'm i'm thinking about the argument that percy and, and annabeth and grover like who literally just like tries to stop them from arguing but <laughs> he's still there yeah but, that's the cutest scene yeah when they're like on when they're in the forest it's when percy's like why don't you ask your mom and then he realizes oh you never talked to your mom either so why are you arguing with me but i'm thinking about that whole scene and like the argument they have later on after everything kind of happens with medusa that like annabeth is mad at him because she finds out that his mom is alive and she didn't know that right he's upset with her because she he had no idea that grover and her had a relationship and before mm -hmm. they ever met him and he's like this th percy i always feel bad because it reminds me so much of stuff that i went through where there always seems to be people that know more about what's going on than you and you're and he's like new to this world and people have all these like they always know more than him like yeah. the thing i'm i'm thinking about is annabeth in this episode i think is really interesting watching percy because she knows about the prophecy about him mm -hmm. and that there is technically not about him but you know yeah. she knows that there's a prophecy about a, a big three kid that is supposed to survive somehow to when they're 16 and that they are going to make a decision that either ends the world or saves it and that they might die Mm -hmm. when that happens percy has no idea that that like this exists he has this entire season he has no idea about this prophecy thing 
but Annabeth talks to him and like treats him as if he does. Like she is asking him like the whole thing of like, why are you afraid of who you are? And like, she's being like, you're much more powerful than you realize. And he's like, he just got here five minutes ago. He yeah. doesn't know that. Like you read a prophecy when you were 10 and you think that he is the person that's gonna fulfill it. And like, granted he does, but like, he doesn't know that. He doesn't know anything. and. So when I watch her be like hard on him and I'm like, can you realize that he doesn't know what you know <laughs> and he doesn't understand any of this stuff yet, but she like talks to him as if he should like it's like the Athena like extreme logic side coming out of being like, well, yeah, you're obviously really powerful. So why, why do you have a problem like thinking that you are and it's like because he's 12 and has no self-esteem <laughs> yeah like this world just opened up to him like two weeks ago come on <laughs> yeah like he's like he's been horribly abused his whole life by other people outside of like the greek pantheon he doesn't he doesn't think that he's worth anything and so no he, he's not gonna realize this he's not gonna think about think that he's doing anything because he doesn't know that he's doing anything differently He's just being himself. He doesn't know that it's weird to like beat Clarice in a fight mm -hmm. until it happens. He doesn't know that it's weird to get a quest so quickly and all this sort of stuff. Like he's, it's just happening to him. And it, so it's like that world makes them feel like they need to keep these things secret from each other and that they can't trust each other. And that's like one of the things about abusive dynamics is that it like makes you feel like you can't you go to people and talk and it's the whole an horrible thing with siblings and abusive families is that we can't we usually don't get along because we can't talk to each other and we should talk to each other but we're told not to and we can't trust each other for one reason or another or we just don't because of the things that our parents do so that we don't do that yeah because a lot of the stuff that they try to do wouldn't work as well if they didn't get along and <laughs> one of the things that one of the like butterfly effect like what if this happened moments in percy jackson i love thinking about is like what if percy brought luke on the quest instead of like grover and it, i don't think that annabeth and percy would have ever become friends and i also think that percy would have died but like even outside of if he would have somehow not you know died or or ended up in tartarus and stuff like that I don't think that either one of, I don't think they would have be, even had a chance to become friends. Yeah, because Luke would have like, totally manipulated them. Yeah, he would have manipulated them. Like, this stuff isn't in the show, but like in the books, he asked Percy like, oh, hey, how are the shoes? Like, do they fit? Are they, are they good? And Percy's like, yeah. And like, in like, when they're in Las Vegas in the book, Luke like specifically tells him not to trust Annabeth. Like she, he's trying to get him not to trust Annabeth when he can see that they're like getting along. They don't have him overtly say that in the show, but it's a definite thing of like the only reason the two these two kids ever like stopped being so afraid of being like betrayed by each other long enough was because Grover was there and because they're on this quest. If that never happened, they never would have figured it out. And so many things would have never happened because these two kids like realizing we're actually on the same team yeah it's like so many better things in their world happen but they never would have gotten there if they weren't forced to do this and it's it's just such an abuse kid thing to like real to all of a sudden realize like the person that annoys me is actually my best friend yeah <laughs> <laughs> like they're actually good for me like wait like because yeah, like there was an aspect of that, like Annabeth was being too hard on him. Like his mother is his mother <laughs> and he just found out that she's not dead. Any, <laughs> anyone, anyone would be upset about that. Yeah, and, she like, was pooped in his face. <laughs> yes, like what are you talking about? Getting mad at him about that? Like, what do you mean if that's his mom? That's like, I love that Grover is like, like I love that Grover, like Grover to like Percy is like her hat is from her mom, and and Percy's like okay, I I get that. I just don't know what else we're gonna do with this freaking head at this point. But with like with Annabeth, he's like, dude, seriously, <laughs> like what are you? Are you really like acting like he's a bad person because he wants to save his mother's life? <laughs> like, but that's like how 
the stuff with like Athena can like really get to you how she like is trying so hard to be a good Athena daughter that she like doesn't see like the humanity of Percy until it literally like slaps her in the face <laughs> and yeah. it, she's like forced to see it because she just has it in her head that she has to be the one in charge and she has to be the one doing everything yeah she really she loves her position she's very protective of it <laughs> she's i i think of like myself and i think maybe even you when you were younger that like we like feeling like we're needed mm -hmm. and that annabeth's role is that she knows how to solve everybody's problems essentially. Yeah. <laughs> and so when when things come up that she doesn't know about or problems happen that you can't she literally like cannot solve like you cannot no matter what you do you can't solve the fact that percy's mom is stuck in the underworld and that she shouldn't be there right now and that you would care and you would care about that mm -hmm. um, that that's yeah that's gonna get that's gonna get to anybody but especially someone like annabeth who doesn't have family outside of this like found family she has already and i think a lot of this episode is her realizing like is it really worth it for me to play this role if I'm here by myself? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love how they, I love how they depicted that wrestling with that throughout this like first series. I think the actress, Leah, her name's Leah, right? Right. Yeah. Is it Leah or Leah? Leah. <laughs> yeah. She's so good. She's so good. So good. She's de like, I agree with Rick. She is Annabeth. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing because she is like nothing like Annabeth. And so watching interviews with her, she's very like funny and like bubbly and making jokes and like, is like singing on set all the time. And is like that bubbly, happy, like super creative, like person. And so she's nothing like Annabeth. So it's amazing to watch her. Absolutely. Like that is Annabeth. Uh, you couldn't have asked for somebody better to do that in front of you <laughs> yeah and it is hard like it's hard for her to and the fact that like leah is that leah is black kind of makes the stuff with annabeth of like wanting to feel like she has a place or like wanting seeming like almost like not wanting to show her own emotions or like her weaknesses just makes way more sense like you don't need to come up with like a backstory like they did in the books to explain it because that's just mm -hmm the experience for black women, especially girls like in the world is people don't care about their feelings. So they're used to not sh being able to show them. Yeah. But it, in le at least in this world, this is a world where Annabeth can and does. <laughs> like the only emotion people seem to recognize is their anger. And that is such a bad stereotype. Um, so yeah, seeing Annabeth kind of come full circle and see like, oh you know like i can feel there's somebody who validates my feelings there's somebody who cares what i think it's really really cool it's a cool part of the series like one of my favorite like abuse kid things that happens that i think is a good thing um unless the person who does it is not a nice person but most of the time it's a good thing is when somebody kind of um points out to you like that you deserve better or that your life could be better in a way that nobody has ever like pointed out to you before like i still remember people that used to come up to me and be like the way that like you're nobody thought that the way my dad treated me was all right but um it was more like the way that like your sister treats you isn't okay or um you don't have to talk to your dad if you don't want to those were like or even just knowing how therapy works those literally like broke my brain <laughs> when things like that when people said things like that and I'm like forever grateful to those people I still remember them even though some of them I haven't talked to in like 20 years but mm -hmm. I love watching Percy and Annabeth do that like at each other it's not just like one way they they both kind of do that and it it's why they are like I will literally destroy this planet if you try to kill them <laughs> and it's like my favorite thing that they would both do that like people talk about Percy doing it a lot but Annabeth also would destroy anyone at all like it's kind of a dynamic when you're in the books that if anyone even says something mean to Clarice and Annabeth is there they like run away <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> because, because it's like nobody wants to be the one to make Annabeth mad because she will kill you. And don't be mean to Percy because that will make her like come after you. <laughs> but yeah. it's a nice dynamic to see that like that's a part of being abused as a kid that usually doesn't get showed because most people who write these things haven't actually gone through that before. And I don't we don't know about Rick Riordan, but enough about how he writes this stuff. He has to have known somebody if he didn't. Because yeah. just too many things are like accurate to how we just go through our life. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't so much a theme of the books, at least the first five that I got this whole you know the gods versus the mortals in the way that they do it in the show where it's like you know percy's supposed to be they give him more of a savior aspect and and i kind of like it i kind of digging it of like he's going to be the one that breaks the generational trauma that the greek gods are perpetuating and um like that didn't ring as true in the books but in the show i love that they're doing it and i love that they're doing it with this cast mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say I was very impressed when I watched an interview with Walker Scobell and he knew that there were more than one Medusa myth. I was like, <laughs> this child did research. <laughs> but I was impressed that he was like, yeah, there's two Medusa myths, but I like, I like the, he said he liked the one that they did on the show better because it was just more interesting to him. Yeah. And but yeah, like the cast does an amazing job kind of making, I think there are themes in the Percy books that was harder to get through because they were children's books, like written for kids. And, but now that it's been 20 years and now that the show is happening, Rick Riordan can be like, this is what I actually wanted to happen. So please show that. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> and yeah, well, and I wonder if like, because he he's been writing for a very long time, you said one of the books came out recently. So I wonder if a portion of it is like, as this series series has developed, I've had more and more of this theme come up. So I want to put this in the earlier versions too now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're the so the way that everything kind of ends in like the fifth book, which um, they're definitely like, writing towards is um when chronos dies and uh grover and annabeth and percy are like in olympus and it's the next time after zeus says he wants to kill percy that percy sees him <laughs> and um they're basically giving them like gifts because they were the one that were right the entire fucking time about about Kronos and about everything and about how they treat their kids and all this stuff. And so they like make Annabeth like the architect for um, Olympus because most of the buildings are destroyed after the war that just happened. They make Grover like the Lord of the of nature because Pan dies in like the fourth book. So he gets to take over that role. And that's when they want to like make Percy a god. Mm -hmm. which is the most like obvious thing from an abuser like we think that you're dangerous because we know you know all of our flaws so we want to make you one of us <laughs> and he tells them no absolutely not i don't want to be a god i want you to pay your child support and that's literally what he says is i don't want any more kids going on quests when they're so young and you have to you have to claim kids by the time they are 13. And like, wow. and he makes them do it. Like they have, and they do it. Like, and he says like build, and you also have to build cabins for all of the gods that are like, not like a major God, but are still gods that are having kids at camp because there's this whole dynamic as the books go on that there are kids that are forced basically to join Luke because their, their godparent doesn't have like a cabin at camp. So they have nowhere to go. They're like forced basically to join him because they have no other choice. Yeah. And if those kids had a place at camp, they wouldn't have joined Luke and this stuff wouldn't have happened. And in the books that have come out since that, like that has been happening. Like they've been building cabins for the other yeah. gods at the other camps. And, but like, like Percy is very like aggressive about it. Like you need to fix your shit right now. This is your fault. This happened because of you and you need to stop doing this. And if you treated your children just like 
three percent better none of this would have ever happened like people wouldn't have joined luke even if luke was like obviously an uh, like abusive person they wouldn't have been tempted to join him if you didn't treat them like absolute human garbage mm -hmm. and it's it's like a big moment of that book that it ends with percy it's one of the funniest things about the books after that is when we have the perspectives of kids that don't know Percy and they hear these things about what he's done. Like, I just think it's hilarious for them to imagine like them hearing that he turned down becoming a God. And <laughs> like yeah. Zeus was like, I want to make you a God. And he was like, no, mm -hmm. no I don't, I don't like you. I don't, I don't want to be you. <laughs> and they like just imagining telling Zeus no ever. They like what? <laughs> um, but yeah, so not many people get to do that. <laughs> yeah. And that is like a thing that kind of builds as the books go on, like especially when you get to like book three is when that stuff gets like more intense because things just start getting more intense. Like kids, literal children die in that book, like a 12 year old gets electrocuted to death in that book. Um, and it already makes me depressed imagining watching like Walker Scobell have to wa do that because his face is going to be really sad <laughs> because yeah. that's going to be really hard. That's it's a 12 year old. And it, and it, it's like a lot of other things like that happen in like the third book and the fourth book that leads up to that happening. And by the point it happens, you're so used to Percy talking about this stuff that it doesn't surprise you that he would tell, you know, them no. Um, but it is like a it's a, it's a huge story with him as a character and I'm glad that they're introducing it so early on in like the first season when that stuff wasn't really brought up yet because it is it is very like I like the fact that he's right away just being like these people these gods are assholes why should I respect them when they don't respect me it, it's kind of funny that it's it's not the first time this has existed within the universe of Greek mythology because Achilles goes on a rant. I think they put it in the movie Troy where he says, you know, the gods envy us because we can, we can change, we can evolve and they can't, they're going to be stuck that way forever. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Percy kind of embodies that so much. I need to find that in the Iliad again, because yeah. like, it it's such a good moment. I Brad Pitt does it justice to in Troy, if I remember correctly. So Yeah, that is like when in the fifth book when he decides that when you like have his like, you know, internal narration about if he wants to be a god or not, that's the kind of stuff he thinks about is like, I wanna be in a relationship with Annabeth. Like I wanna see my mom. I want I wanna see like my mom maybe have his mom eventually has like another kid. Mm -hmm. um, like, I want to, like, I want to graduate high school. I want to, like, live a life. I don't want to stay 16 years old forever. I want to, like, grow and, like, learn and change. And mm -hmm. I don't want to stay how I am forever right now. I, that's the whole point of life is that it doesn't last forever. I want to, like, actually experience life. Yeah. And, like, that's why he, like, says no. Like, I don't. I don't want to do that. I want to actually live my life. And actually, to talk about like how Percy and Annabeth do similar things, Annabeth in the third book basically does the same thing. She's like, there's this whole storyline about her possibly joining Artemis's hunters. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't know if she is going to because she's kidnapped. <laughs> for like the whole book they like find he finds like that she had like something about joining them like a brochure or whatever in her backpack and so that whole book he's basically terrified that once he saves her life that she's going to abandon him and join the hunters and he's never going to see her again and like he tries to like tell her like when he's scared that she's going to join to not join but he's like basically having a panic attack when he's trying to like he can't like get the words out and she like is so concerned about him that she's like oh my god like breathe <laughs> like yeah. he's just freaking out and then she ends up not joining but it's the same thing for her like i want to like actually live my life mm -hmm. i don't i don't want to stay 15 or 14 years old forever i want to actually be able to be as as human as i possibly can mm -hmm. um it's just it's 
thing just because of who they are, that they are the people that do that because it's kind of a, a, a trope or whatever in stories like this of being like, oh, but we don't want Percy and Annabeth to die. So maybe one day they'll turn into gods. And I'm like, that would be like, honestly, the worst thing that has ever happened to them. Yeah, they wouldn't want that. They would hate it. They would, they would be so upset. And it just goes against everything of who they are. And so if that happened, that would be like the ultimate, like, betrayal um, by whoever made them a god. <laughs> and so I don't think that it will happen, even if we don't want these characters to die. It's but like that one that one guy in the Volturi who wants to die. Yeah. <laughs> the one like I, I in the like flash to the the war, mm -hmm. someone murders him and he's like, finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, I just wanna this is annoying. Yeah. That's that's definitely who they would be. They would just want somebody to kill them and they would probably be really angry about the fact that they're so powerful that most people wouldn't be able to kill them. Like they would probably do the thing where they like would not use their powers on purpose so that they could just not be around anymore. And it probably still wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. At least for Percy's side of it, it probably wouldn't work. And he wouldn't let Annabeth die even as a god. So it's like they would both just kind of be stuck having to deal with that. Um, what was I going to say about this episode? I was going to say about Electo, the um the fury. fury i thought it was really interesting how her conversation with annabeth where she was basically like this kid is annoying um and he's going to mess up your quest so why don't just let me kidnap him and mm -hmm. just the way that they were talking as if they were like equals in some way and especially now that we because the whole season is out and we know that um she was actually looking they she wanted to kidnap him because they thought that he had Hades's helm and wanted to just take him to the underworld basically to ask about that or something and who knows what they would have done if they actually took him then because he didn't have it i don't know if they would believe him mm -hmm. but it was just a really interesting i thought one thing that's interesting with this season is for kid for kids or people who did not read the book mm -hmm. um a lot of people thought that the traitor was Annabeth <laughs> um, when it was Luke. And I get why, but they put things in for basically every major character to make you wonder if they are by the time you get to the end. But mm -hmm. I, I thought it like watching this episode again today, I was like, oh, that's interesting because I know so much about these characters that I know that Annabeth wouldn't like turn Percy over. But there is this moment when she goes back to the bus and she's coming in and telling them like, hey, you have to like break this window because a fury is coming after us that you're wondering if you don't know that you're wondering like is she doing that so that she can get them outside and alone so that this fury can kill them or mm -hmm. is she doing that because she's actually trying to save them until she like stabs one of them and yeah. kills them and then you realize that she's not turning against percy but i just thought that was such an interesting dynamic to watch the fury that killed thalia basically yeah um, talking to annabeth as if they were at like the same like intelligence level well i feel like so i think the only monster where we know their power was to kind of manipulate how people feel is sirens um in the odyssey but i like that that's kind of given to all of the monsters that they like if they were a D, D characters they'd have charisma stats you know like they actually have some motivation to try to sway people to their side or to try to get people to do what they want to do and it's it's like they picked up these doubts that she was already having and yeah and it's interesting so early she's able to fight them i mean they they probably could have gotten away with giving her more time to consider am i gonna do this like but of course it's it's like what 45 minute episodes so they can't do that well and one thing i thought what it's just kind of an interesting dynamic throughout the season that is highlighted a little bit in this episode is um the like one of the lines that people bring up all the time is when percy says like when he tells them that he was told that he's going to be betrayed by someone mm -hmm. and so when he finds out that like grover knew annabeth first and he never knew that he 
that's even more upsetting to him because it's like I thought that you were like the one person that would always be on my side or put me first and I didn't know that you already knew her but the other part of that is that he says like I picked Annabeth because I didn't think we would ever be friends and a lot of people are like oh like why does he think that and it's like because he doesn't like himself (laughs) and and also because mostly because if you really think about it and look at how she like reacts around him, what about her behavior would ever make somebody think, especially somebody like Percy, would make him think that um she literally watched him get beat up by Clarice twice. Like yeah. like he like she he's at camp for two weeks, right? She yeah. stalks him at camp. Like she just follows him around at camp and just stares at him. <laughs> and then during like the fight, she like makes him stand on a rock, basically making him like bait he doesn't know that that's what he's doing at first but he figures it out pretty quickly when he starts getting attacked and he is scared thinking that he's gonna die when three old like aries kids are trying to kill him or stab him at least and to find out that she was there the entire time and just watch it that all happened to him wasn't she there for the bathroom thing too i feel like she 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 was there and like said after like for the bathroom part was watching because she just follows him around camp and like one of the first like their first interaction is when he's like waking up and out of it when he's like first waking up and she's just staring at him when he's sleeping and yeah. she says like the, you know you drew when you sleep line but he picks her assuming that she's just another bully or another person that just doesn't like him because he's yeah. to nobody liking him and just assumes like oh well if i have to go on a quest i'm gonna pick the person that i know already doesn't like me but is smart and so she probably will help me not die um and will do like the right thing even if i can't do it or whatever and i'll pick like somebody who would be a good friend of mine that i think would work but it's just interesting how he picks annabeth because he thinks that she doesn't like him and so it's like well if she betrays me it's not going to hurt my feelings that bad because i already know she hates me yeah (laughs) and then within like the first day or so that they're out there it's that starts getting messed up and it's just funny how they do that without trying like his whole thing of taking her was oh she'll push me down a flight of stairs if it means that the quest will continue and literally in the next episode he pushes she's like pushing him down a flight of stairs to leave the arch in st louis and he's like no (laughs) and he pushes her out instead yeah like dude (laughs) That did not work the way you thought it was going to. <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> I I do love that the nature of prophecies, you don't know whether or not her pat. Well, I guess you do. In this one, you do know for sure that her passing on betraying him means that Luke was always going to be the one to do it. But it would have been interesting if if it was like the idea that you can't escape prophecy in the end, but it can shift. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they could have done that there too. But Luke always meant to betray him, so that doesn't work. That scene with Luke in this episode, I like forgot that that happened, but it's <laughs> it's one of those scenes that when I think about it, I'm like, yeah, Luke is just evil. And I know that people try to don't like that or they try to be like he's well-meaning, but he just like got lost, he was being manipulated by Cronus whatever. And I'm like, no. I think he's just an very angry person that just wants to be angry because how else do you explain that scene where he like goes out of his way to give percy those shoes that are meant to kill him and suck him into the hell dimension yeah (laughs) especially the thing that is hard about all of that is that when you've read the books (laughs) and you know how horrific tartarus is like there's no sun it's just always dark there they have to drink fire because it's the only water that is there is fire um they can't find any the only food they find are like food that people have like offered to gods that end up in tartarus that's the only food they find when they're down there and like oh the thing that makes me the most upset is the fact that when they're down there to percy it smells like his stepdad he says it smells like gabe and i'm like because I'm just imagining being in a place that where I have to smell things that remind me of my dad I would be fucking murderous the entire time that I was down there and he is and but it's like imagining 
12 year old tiny little Percy in a place like that when he doesn't know what's going on like it's hard enough when he's like 17 and that's yeah. going on. it's horrific that that book is like honestly her I don't remember most of it because of the things they go through are horrific and so i um, watching like Luke be like yeah you're my friend and then he's gonna send him down there. Six these shoes so that I can frame you for everything that I've been doing. That where I've been trying to kill you at least six times by this point in your life, and it, and just especially because Percy sits is sitting there and apologizing to him for not taking him on the quest, and he feels like he has to give him a reason. Yeah, I think it's absolutely hilarious that he <laughs> that he doesn't take luke on the quest because luke talked so nicely about annabeth mm -hmm. <laughs> that that's the reason why like percy takes annabeth instead and that's just so funny to think about <laughs> like yeah. whoops you fucked that up <laughs> but it is like a horrible dynamic once you know like and really think about it that percy is like this 12 year old kid and he's sitting there apologizing to a 19 year old adult why he didn't take him on a quest when that person is trying to kill him and it's just horrible to think that like you could have not given him those shoes like you could have not done that but you did and you were really excited about doing it <laughs> and so <laughs> oh so it's like there's no way to like explain that other than you knew what you were going to do to him and there's no other way to like look at that and it's just it's hard to like watch Percy be like, I'm trying to, he thinks that Luke is his only like friend at that point. And it's like, oh God, well, his, <laughs> it's just bad. Well, Luke did too good of a job of being his friend because he was afraid to lose him. Like he was, he was like, if you end up being the person that betrays me, ooh, I don't like that idea. Yeah. Like it's like, it's really bad. <sighs> I also yeah. want to give a shout out to to Grover for the consensus song. Oh my gosh, that was such a cute scene. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what to do, so I'm gonna go kindergarten teacher. Yeah. Oh. Oh. One thing I was gonna say is, one um, there's this chapter in Mark of Athena, which is the books later on, where you get perspectives from other characters, and so you get chapters in those series from like Annabeth's perspective, and in Mark of Athena. There is this part, I forget what she's, why she's talking about it, um, but she just has like a line in there where she's basically talking about how much she loves Percy and that she can't imagine like her life without him at this point because they've gone through so many things. But she says like, I've had a, I've secretly had a crush on him since I was 12 years old. And the scene when he starts singing the like consensus song and he has that like asshole, like smile on his face. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's where her crush started. <laughs> Especially after the scene when um, he watches her or she watches him like use like the Medusa head. Mm -hmm. It's like there's like so many things that you could like talk about what you think she's like thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's thinking about that he's probably the prophecy kid and like is like what are we going to do about this because this kid is supposed to die but I like this person. Yeah. And there's like this whole that whole dynamic for like many years throughout the books of Annabeth almost like trying to stop herself from caring about him because of course the person that's prophesied to die is the person that she cares about a lot. Yeah. Oh, but I love their dynamic. I really do. I love that they challenge each other to be better. Mm -hmm. Like that's the kind of relationship that really does last. And I love that Rick gave that to them. Mm -hmm. And I love that they show them doing that stuff from a young age, just to show that you can do like, you don't need to like wait until you're older, almost like you can be a 12 year old kid and try to talk to somebody that you think doesn't like you or whatever, and try to figure it out so that you can actually be friends. Cause there's, there's honestly a million reasons for why Annabeth and Percy shouldn't have ever even gotten to the point of being friends. It would have been easier for them not to, they had to actually, they have to like put in a lot of effort in order to keep and maintain like that friendship for many years because it actively makes their life harder honestly to have that like um 
In the third book, when Annabeth gets kidnapped, the reason, one of the reasons why they don't let Percy join the quest at first, he just joins it without their permission, but he just, he just leaves camp and he's like, I'm just going anyway and I'm just going to stalk you guys until I can help you. But they don't pick him at first because they're like, you're just going because you just want to save Annabeth. Yeah. And he literally has nothing to say to that. Because, like, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, that is, I do. That's the reason why. Thank you for figuring me out. <laughs> like, yeah. But it's like it's every in every book, it becomes more and more difficult for for that to be a part of their life because their life is so like violent. But it's also like a thing of like they just don't care. <laughs> Even by like the end of like the first book, they're like, yeah, I don't care. Like, it would be easier for me to not like this kid or not care as much about him, but I would rather not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, like, immediately changes her for the better on that first quest. Mm -hmm. And she recognizes that. Yeah. And she does even with him. Like, that's what's... Because I've usually been in the Percy role in my life where I, like, am, like, constantly sacrificing myself for everyone else and I'm not used to people thinking that I matter and all that kind of stuff. Um, I love seeing that stuff of when Annabeth gets upset about him wanting to do that stuff or just doesn't let him or just finds a way to, like, save him or just shows him, like, no, I want you to be here. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I want you to be alive. I would rather have you around. And even in this, even in this episode, like her choosing not to like turn him in, like if he knew about that, when that was going on, he probably would just assume that she would because it would make more sense and it would make their quest easier. Like he tries to sacrifice himself so the quest can continue on at least five different times. <laughs> like It's like, I was like thinking about it the other day. I was like, he tries to sacrifice his life so that the quest can continue on without him because he thinks that that's a possibility in episode four, five, seven, and eight. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my the gosh. only episodes he doesn't do it in are two of them before the quest even exists <laughs> and like when they go to the casino in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> but, but like there, she's also um a big role with him in that way where he can talk to her about the stuff that's going on and she will actually listen to him and like one thing that um one critique of the tv show that really bothered me was how people said that percy was too smart um in the show they said he like figured things out too fast or he wasn't this smart in the book and it felt very ableist because I'm like, why wouldn't Percy be smart? He yeah. is smart in the books. He figures out that it's Kronos at the end of the first book in the book. Like, that's not like something they added in. He figures out a lot of things on his own. And it feels like you think that he's like this wacky kid with dyslexia and ADHD, and there's no possible way that he could be intelligent just because he's not like a serious person like Annabeth is. Um, God, now I forgot what I was going to say, but like yeah. it just it bothers me how people oh i know because annabeth respects his intelligence yeah like, she doesn't talk down to him she doesn't talk to him as if she knows she knows like certain things more than him and she's an intelligent person herself but like when they're talking about like their plans or things like that th she doesn't talk to him as if she is automatically better than him and she shouldn't listen to anything he has to say and that's probably one of the first people in his entire life that has ever um, talked to him that way. Like, I always think, like, in the fourth episode when they're on the train, he asks, like, can I ask a stupid question? And the questions he asks are in no way stupid. He mm -hmm. asks, we're going to L.A., we're, how do we know where we're going to go? And, they're like, we have no fucking idea. And the other question he asks is like i told you guys that the quest is supposed to fail and nobody's talked about that shouldn't we talk about that like those are both incredibly like yes those are things we should talk about <laughs> but he frames it as can i ask a stupid question and because he's used to people thinking that he's stupid and that's like a dynamic of percy and annabeth that i feel like people don't talk about enough because there's all the other like big kind of romantic gestures but 
that's a big part of like their friendship that turns into a relation a romantic relationship later on is that she respects him and knows that he's a smart person and doesn't think just because he has ADHD and doesn't isn't able to like kind of mask it the way that she can mm -hmm. doesn't mean that he doesn't offer anything or that he's not smart enough to figure this stuff out on his own which is really nice because that really bothered me how people I was like stop stop talking about Percy like he's stupid just because he's not like a book nerd doesn't mean that he's not smart yeah and like I mean that's kind of a thing that exists in my relationship too of just someone whose intelligence was never taken seriously so Jake pretty immediately from the sounds of it did not do well in school and like just had trouble like he says from the time he got into high school he knew he could never have graduated on time with what the classes that they put him in and i was the first person to be like okay listening to this guy he's smart he's driven there's motivation there like why why has his life turned out this way you know and i was the first person to be like okay, you know, you don't have to do things the traditional way, you know, that you could go get your GED, go to community college for a little while, and then figure out what you're going to do. And so you just, it's so important to have that. Yeah. To have, like, I even, like, when I was, <sighs> my dad and sister told me a lot that I was stupid. And so it's still hard for me to believe that I'm not stupid, even though there's a part of me that's like, people keep saying that I'm smart, so I have to be, because why would all these people lie to me? <laughs> and, but like, I remember when I was in like high school and stuff that my mom used to try to convince me that I was smart. And she would be like, are you even trying like with your classes? And I was like, not really, like I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I like could barely, it was a huge like challenge for me to try to study enough because like newsflash, when you dissociate a lot and don't want to remember things, you don't remember things for school either. Yeah. And so um, that was, that was really challenging. And, um, but she was like, you're not even trying really in the, in school and you're still able to get like C's and yeah, you have like a 2.5 GPA when you could do more, but you're like still able to like get by and graduate even though you're barely even trying and showing up to school most of the time like exhausted all the time mm -hmm. and i just was like you're you're just saying that to me because you're my mom and you have to be nice to me like mm -hmm. i would not she tried to convince me for at least like two decades that i was intelligent and i was like you're just lying to me yeah and so it's such a nice thing when somebody actually can somehow get through to you yeah like that's the stuff that you just don't think of like with jake of yeah you don't have to go to college or you don't have to go to like fuck regular high school like honestly i wish that my life would have been better if i didn't go to normal high school and i would have been able to go to like i don't know get my g i could have just gotten my ged and just there's some it. sort of exam you can take to test out of high school i i found out about this because someone i know did it i don't know too many details but i know he like tested himself out of high school and then went into community college and then here in california at least there's like there they call it junior college where your high school will have a program where you can go to community college and um like there's so many non-traditional ways to do it and intelligence comes in all different shapes and forms but because we've made these mandated school kind of environments we are only catering to one type of learning and that is not going to work for the, the majority of people. Like I am also some flavor of neurodivergent, but love being in a classroom, can sit there and learn by osmosis practically. But, you know, Jake, when he does that, doesn't happen for him. He has to literally study for hours on end. Like, you know, it's people are different and intelligence looks different. And Percy's type of intelligence is more like i hate when people say street smart but he's more people smart he's more like um situationally aware and he likes to think outside of the box and that is also a type of intelligence to be able to see beyond what everybody else is gonna see mm -hmm. like to <laughs> the whole narrative of him being an abused kid that's what you have to do like yeah. when when you're in an environment growing up where you're not safe and you're kind of forced to like roll with the punches 
and figure out how to do whatever you need to do to like keep yourself as safe as possible those are the kind of skills that you end up like having whether you mean to or not you just kind of find ways to get around things in a way that works for you without having to like ask for help or without having to tell anybody what's really going on because you know that you can't and you just kind of figure it out as you're going along and that's Percy's entire personality but that's 100% the kind of things that you learn when you have to learn how to survive at like a young age and you know that you don't have other people to depend on you just kind of learn how to do it yourself Ooh. and it is like a way like it's what you were talking about with like class one thing that I think is so funny about autistic people is that we love learning new things but despise homework and tests like that's my whole thing with school like always like when i was in college and even like the many years after when i was like thinking about going back and even up to now honestly there are so many classes that i would take that i would have so much fun like i changed my major in my head like at least seven different times when i was like a freshman and a sophomore because there's so many different things that i'm interested in like i could do an entire degree on like art history and I would be happy. I could do a degree in like theater. I could do a degree in like in just normal history or English or creative writing. There's like so many things that I'm interested in that I could take an entire like like class schedule to get a degree, but I don't do it because I hate homework and I hate like tests. Like I hate the idea that I have to like take this arbitrary thing and like prove that I understand what I'm learning. Like, why can't I just learn things? Yeah, and, just to learn them. Like, why can't I just learn stuff and be done with it? Like, why do I need to like, how does doing, that was like my whole thing and especially in middle school, but especially in high school. And yeah. after that was like, I don't understand why I have to do homework because it seems like a waste of time. It feels like I'm just doing things to like keep busy because I don't learn from doing homework. Mm -hmm. Like I learned from the things we do in class. So why am so I would just not do homework. Yeah. Some of the time, or do only do like half of it because I the other thing about being autistic is that you physically cannot it's very hard to get us to do things that we don't want to do or we feel like there's no reason for us yeah. to do it. like I cannot make my like I think it's funny when people say that they like will read a book that they don't like. I physically am incapable of like reading a book or watching something if I don't find it interesting like I literally cannot do if I don't find a book interesting I'm I'm done with it I'm never looking at it ever again or thinking about it again after that and so it's the same way with school like I can't I literally can't like I can't I would try because I knew that I was supposed to and the high school I went to was super like insanely like educational wise like competitive like we don't we don't have a valedictorian at my high school because there's so many people that take so many AP classes that have a 4.0 GPA they, they can never pick one person <laughs> and it's like incredibly aggressive <laughs> like I took I took an advanced composition class when I was a junior that was the same stuff that I learned in like my English classes my freshman and sophomore year of college like it was so easy for me then because I didn't have to learn anything new um but like that's how aggressive it was there and so i would try to force myself to do it because i would know that i was supposed to but i just i couldn't make myself do it and then i just felt like i was like i believe the people in my life told me that i was stupid because i like kept doing badly on and it was like if i can't do homework then how <laughs> can i really do it? because the idea of like another way of doing school was not even offered at all especially when i was in school yeah i didn't i just didn't even understand how it worked like uh that's the only reason i got like i got pretty bad grades i would say in middle school and i just did not get the connection between you need to do all the assignments and do all the homework and turn it in to get the points to get the grade mm -hmm. it was like more once i got to high school that i understood the way it worked a little bit more and then the the like golden child praise kink kicked in and it was like <laughs> I want to get good grades because that is a good girl. <laughs> that is like. <laughs> I'm sorry, the golden trail praise card. Well, what happened? I need to log off in a couple minutes, but. Um... Oh, sorry.
the call connected while I'm online. <laughs> okay. The praise kink is making me laugh about our whole conversation about Annabeth because she basically went through the whole cycle of that of being like, I don't think this is worth it. <laughs> like she figured it out sooner than than you did or definitely sooner than my sister has. <laughs> Yeah, your sister, I don't know if she'll get there. But um, I have to go because I have people trying to, to contact me. Um, but yeah, let's talk. Episode four, was that the one with the arch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will talk the arch. I'm going to do research on the monsters in that one. Yeah, I kid this fun, so that should be fun. Yep. Okay, bye. Bye.